Goldstein. Um, he's got more than 35 years experience in using and uh, evaluating performance improvement interventions. Uh, he's had clients such as uh, the Air Force, he's co-authored the Army's um, Test Construction Manual. He's also published several handbooks, uh, including the performance in the workplace. He's a former IPI board member, and IPI has a quarterly journal uh, that, that is all research-based, uh, and, and Dr. Prostein is, is the current uh, editor-in-chief of, of that quarterly journal. Um, so he's going to talk to us about evaluation and, and measurement. And you Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark, could you find that clicker? I should not find a clicker, so you want me to click that one? No, it's okay. Right. I'll do it. I just don't... Uh, like hiding behind the lectern, generally. Uh, but this will get me moving back and forth. I've heard my back recently, so standing and moving is actually better for me than sitting anyway. So I am Rich Pearlstein, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I really am, and uh, I just don't like an auditorium setup. I wish we had little tables and like that, but you all are in little clusters, and I'm gonna make you work together in little groups anyway, because uh, uh, if I had all the answers, I wouldn't be me, and you have some of the answers. But anyway, I want to start out by thanking some people for having me uh, here. First is Guy Wallace, who uh, originally invited me, and he's one of the, uh, he's a past ISPI president. I've known Guy for years. He's a, a very dynamic, uh, speaker, presenter. He's, if you don't know it, he's published some books, including one maybe 10 years ago called Lean ISD. And uh, so if you're dealing with big systems of instruction, uh, Guy's the guru, and I'm really honored that uh, Guy invited me here. Also, uh, I want to thank uh, Dick Hanshaw, because he and Guy got this chapter together and went from um, basically uh, Jump Street to 180 people in a little over a year, right? So I think that's the fastest growth of any ISBI uh, chapter in history. And uh, then I need to thank uh, Mark Donaldson. Actually, I want to thank uh, Mark, who did all the heavy carrying and arranging for me to come here. Yeah, so thanks, Mark. And how about Shannon Godwin? Is Shannon here? Okay, well, then I don't have to thank her. No, actually, <laughs> uh, I did want to thank Shannon, who took the time to interview me on the uh, phone and help put together the uh, piece on things I had to say in, in uh, your newsletter. So, let's see, I think I'm supposed to start with some kind of icebreaker or something. Who likes icebreakers? Can I see hands? Okay. Three people. That's good. That, that, goes, that goes well with the uh, story I have to tell, which is about an esteemed colleague who gave a presentation in Japan, where very few people spoke English in this particular town where he did it. It wasn't Guy, but it was a professor. And he gave this presentation, and it was a smashing success. The, audience roared at his beginning story, they paid rapt attention, and they uh, applauded. So he was very thrilled, and they made a videotape of it for him. Uh, that's what they had back in the day. And he brought it back, and he played it for his graduate students at a picnic he held one weekend. And the, uh, one of his graduate students was Japanese, and as he was shown it, she began frowning. And he said, what happened? He said, well, your translator did may, maybe didn't say what you thought. When you started, you told this joke, and everybody laughed, right? Yeah. He said, well, what the translator actually said is that the American gentleman is going to start, like so many Americans do, with a funny story. <laughs> it does not translate well into Japanese. So if you will just listen and then laugh and applaud when he finishes, I'm sure we'll get down to business. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, that's the icebreaker, and that's pretty much what I think of them. Uh, okay, who in here uh, has done evaluation? 
Just raise your hand. Okay, it looks like more than half the people. Uh, it's hard to be in this profession, human performance improvement, without having some experience in evaluation. So suppose I came here, just feel your feet on the floor for a second, breathe, center yourself in your uh, chair. And suppose I'm here and I look at you and say, I'm here to evaluate your program. Take a breath. How does that feel? Threatening. Okay. Uh, if I come here and I uh, say, boy, they're here to evaluate me, then I feel threatened. So it's a word that's kind of charged. And I want us to bear that in mind as we get going. I'm going to start these slides. That's, that's the welcome. And what you can see on it is that, uh, well, before I go on, is, is there too much light up front for you to see the slides? Well, yes. Yeah. How do we dim these lights? <laughs> I got one button. <laughs> one button. Okay, it's all on or all off, huh? Is there anything over here? No. Who knows what's going to happen? This could be that, like that uh, gecko and the uh, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> light starts starting. Uh, anyway, I guess we'll suffer. Uh, it builds character. Anyway, <laughs> if you're skating along the data, you can see that you got your ups and downs. That's, that's all that's uh, about. So uh, I'm going to uh, start in a typical uh, performance improvement way by telling you the objectives I think we're here to address. Um, at the end of the session, you ought to be able to uh, list some common obstacles to effective evaluation. There won't be a test, so we won't really know whether you can do this or not, but it's sort of my intention. I want you to be able to explain to key stakeholders the impact of obstacles to evaluation, what it does to an organization if it can't evaluate. And coupled with that, you need at least three strategies for overcoming obstacles. Fair enough? And finally, uh, convince key stakeholders to support efforts for evaluating performance improvement effectively. So who might stakeholders be? A little louder, please. Managers and employees, advisors. Managers, employees, who, who else? Say again? A project sponsor. A project sponsor. A customer. Customers. Actually, anybody affected by the project. Um, so the more support you can build, the better. So those are the objectives I have in mind. But they're not necessarily why you came. Why don't you shout out if you have some other objectives. Tell me what they are, and I'll let you know if we maybe will touch on them. Anything else? Thoughts about Kirkpatrick? Okay, yeah, we're going to do that. Talk about Kirkpatrick. Okay. You, know, you pointed out stakeholders. Say what? You pointed out stakeholders. The stakeholders are sort of like termites. Or if you're in, like, living in a big city, cockroaches. They're all over the place, but you can't find them all. Uh -huh. And how do we find those folks? Okay. How do you get the stakeholders to crawl out into the light? <laughs> okay. And something over here? Yes? Yeah, getting the buy-in from managers to and the business to actually conduct the evaluation. That is something we'll touch on. I'm not so sure about getting the uh, stakeholders out into the light. Yes? I'm not sure if your three strategies would touch on any of the uh, things around things like smart sheets and combining levels and that type of thing. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm hoping we'll have some time to go beyond. I'm going to talk about six common obstacles. 
and ways to overcome them. But I'm hoping we'll have some time to get some discussion in here where we can tap your experience on what are other obstacles and what has worked to help overcome them. And I, I saw another, yes. Some ideas for performing level three evaluations. Okay, uh, we'll touch on level three evaluation and some ideas. I have a chapter in the book, uh, Handbook of uh, Performance Improvement 2010. It's the third one. There are three of those that ISPI published at once, and this is one on measurement and evaluation. And I have, my chapter basically offers tips and tricks for evaluating at Kirkpatrick's four different levels. There was a reference to that in the handout. Uh, how many of you printed out the handout that was uh, published and brought it with you? Okay. Who needs a copy? I printed out a few, and I can give you a, a copy if you need it. Okay. Rather than my walking around and all, who wants to pass them out for me to those of you? You will? Thanks very much. What's your name? Thank you, Ursula. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You have your hand up. Oh, you're waiting for a hand up. Okay. So I'm going to go on with this while uh, Ursula is distributing the hand ads. This is an agenda for what I think we're going to cover. And it will cover most of uh, what were in the objectives and most of the things aside from the cockroaches that, that you mentioned. Um, right now we're doing part of an introduction, but the main introduction I'm going to get to in a minute is about Kirkpatrick, its uses, uh, problems with it, things like that. After that, so we have a context, then I'll move on to challenges and obstacles. What I'll do is go through six common challenges that I've encountered, um, and then I'll give you, one by one, what I've found can work to help overcome those obstacles. And some of those are in areas that some of you have mentioned. Um, I'll stop at each one and see what additional ideas you have. And if you're not responsive, I'm going to get everybody to stand up and jump to get the the juice is flowing, or some kind of exercise. There will be physical exercises if you're not the sun. <laughs> okay. Then, with what time we have left after all that, I would like to look at other obstacles you've encountered. And that's what I threatened about earlier, about getting you to talk in small groups, and then come up with your ideas, and then give them out to uh, everyone in general. How's that say? Great. Great. Okay. We can move on. Okay. My perspective is that evaluation uh, is organizational research. That's all it is. So uh, what I'm doing in this uh, introduction is taking a quick look at evaluation. And then just a minute about evaluation as an evidentiary chain. Did you read the piece in the newsletter? Who read that piece about the evidentiary chain? OK, two or three people. That's good. So I won't bore everyone to tears if I go through that a little bit. Um, and finally, evaluation, when we think about it in performance improvement, most of the examples are in terms of training. And training is a big part of what many of us do. But evaluation can be used for any performance improvement intervention. Modifying reward systems, modifying other aspects of the environment, like providing job aids, tools, uh, giving feedback in different ways, all kinds of things. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So let's move on right through this list. This is my take on how evaluation is usually done. 
Anybody had seen it like this? You get us to sit around like, what should we be finding out? What should we ask? Uh, and you list questions. And I'm seeing some grins, so I'm thinking that you're not unfamiliar with that. And then, when you get all those answers, well, what's it mean? We'll figure it out. The problem is that's backwards from how we really should be doing it. First, find out, scare the, ask George to figure out how to get the termites to come out into the light. And once you've found them, find out what they really want to know about the program. What decisions do they have to make? Do we continue to fund this? Should we expand it? Who could benefit from the program? Find out what it is that you need to answer, and then figure out what information you need to collect. And it'll probably be a lot narrower a focus than if you sat down to begin with and just thought of every question you could possibly ask. But your stakeholders will appreciate it, the people you survey will appreciate it, and so on. Are you with me? Yes? yes. Good. I apologize for the lack of a clicker, but I refuse to just hide back here. Okay, so what about Kirkpatrick? Uh, people talk about Kirkpatrick's model. I don't think that's accurate. It's more of a taxonomy. I pointed that out in the chapter in the Human Performance Handbooks that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, I recently found out from one of my graduate students that somebody had actually published that in an article back in the 80s. Uh, it's a taxonomy, not a, not a uh, model. Well, why do I make the difference? It's because trainers had been using the four levels well before Kirkpatrick codified. And the four levels are the first one, participant reactions what worked and what didn't from the participants' perspectives. You all know about that one? What, are, what is that level often called? Smile sheet. Say again? Smile sheet. Smile sheet. I'm, I'm getting deaf in my old age. That's exactly it. Uh, level two is participant changes at the end of the intervention. Kirkpatrick calls that learning. But it could be other, other forms of behavior change. So I just talk about it as the end of uh, what's different at the end of the intervention, just in case you're not doing training. Level three, OK, so people have learned something, or they now do something differently for whatever reason. You've seen that at the end of the intervention. How do you know they'll continue to do it on the job? Well, you have to look and see. Do the participants reliably perform in new ways on the job? Some people uh, call that level impact. Level four, to me, is the most important one, impact on organizational outcomes. What's improved as a result of the intervention? And was it worth it? After all, if somebody were to give you an endless supply of money and you could experiment for as long as you wanted, you might be able to uh, improve things. But if the value of the improvement was far less than the money you threw at it, what have you really done? I mean, I can think of examples where <clears throat> you might want to do something where the return on investment isn't so good, but it's still critical to get a change. You might want to save lives, for example, and people might assign uh, unfortunately low prices to the value of a life, but you've got to do it anyway if you've got risky business. Does that make sense? Yes. If it doesn't, would you tell me? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, Phillips calls ROI level five, but as I say, because if you've caused change and it's not worth it, then how have you really helped with the outcomes? I consider it part of level four. Some other people do. <coughs> uh, Jack, uh, 
what's his uh, partner's name? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have a great business and they do good work, but uh, part of their selling it is as a fifth level, and uh, I just think these four cover it pretty well. So, information at uh, level one and two uh, can help you improve design and delivery. I just mocked a minute ago, I mocked level one by asking you what it's called, usually. The smile sheets, that's sort of a derogatory term. Uh, and rightfully so. But participant reactions can surface problems. Uh, it can surface problems like uh, imagine that you've had an ACE instructor who does the same course, uh, a particular course, once a month. And ratings are like this pretty steadily, and then one month it goes like this. Ratings of the instructor really plummets. If you were the manager, wouldn't you want to know what happened differently? Was there a special disruption in class? Was the instructor sick? What happened? So. It's some information that you, if you weren't on site, you can still get information from it. Uh, another example of information from level one is uh, people can tell you their experience of the training facility. It was so hot, I couldn't stay awake. It was so noisy, I couldn't hear half the thing. So there's useful things you can get from it. And then level two, measurement shows whether your intervention worked initially. If you measure knowledge or performance before the intervention and then after, and there is an improvement, you may be able to say that your intervention caused that improvement. You might want a control group, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just having the measures uh, shows whether you got some initial success from your intervention. Now, at level three and four, the information can help you get organizational support. You may be able to get some of the uh, termites to crawl out from the woodwork. Uh, for one thing, at level three, is it being used on the job? You have to thank management for that uh, to some extent, because if it's being used, it's also because management is encouraging it, promoting it, rewarding it. And then the outcome data, what's actually improved in the organization as a result of the new behavior that's spread to the job, uh, that can also scare the termites out. It can make stakeholders who want to take some of the credit show up. Oh, what we did uh, has uh, actually improved things. We've affected the bottom line. We've increased customer satisfaction. We've improved the quality of our services, whatever measures you're looking at. Sir? Don't you think uh, information from level three could also help improve the design? Yes. Uh, information from every level can help do that, but I'm, I'm just saying what I think the focus is on. Primarily. Different okay. levels. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. I feel so low tech having to come back here. But there's the evidentiary chain. It works backwards. I had a conversation with uh, Tiagi once about Kirkpatrick. You all saw Tiagi here before. Right? And I said, Well, what do you think? What do you do? And he said, Level four. That's it. And you know, basically, I agree with that. Uh, you want to know if the outcomes have been. But um, in order to do that, let's just look at it this way. Suppose I do something, and then later on I, uh, I go and I measure uh, outcomes, and they've changed. Can I say it's because of what I did? You know, maybe I can. Maybe if I've had the control groups, I can and all. But I'll make a more solid case if I go back and say, not only did organizational, uh, did, uh, let's take an example, not only did customer satisfaction increase, but 
uh, we found that uh, our employees were treating customers better on the job. Back here on level three. Now, can you say that the fact that they're treating them better on the job has something to do with something you did? You have to go back one more. Did they change their behavior? Are, for example, the employees uh, now uh, being rewarded when they treat customers well, whereas before they were uh, maybe punished because they took too much time? Got to keep those calls going. Don't help the customer. It might, oh, your minute's up. Hang up. Uh, you see where I'm going with that? Uh, you have to point backwards and, sh and make the case all the way back to the beginning. Now, that first one is optional. Uh, in a lot of organizations, it's, uh, well, employees don't have a choice about whether they uh, participate in an intervention or not. Training might be mandatory. They have a new reward system laid on them, things like that. But in other organizations, they may have a choice if they want to join this program, go to that training, what have you. In that case, you have to go back there and see if, in fact, people uh, did want to come, if it, had, if it generated good buzz. Any questions about the evidentiary chain? No? It's not an observation, though. Excuse me? An observation? You, you, I know the focus of this is evaluation, but what you're really talking about is a continuous cycle between evaluation and design. Because you're talking about level one, level two, level three, level four, change behavior, about, will change behavior occur on the job? Well, frankly, that, you know, that's a question to ask. Then the, the design parallel to that is, well, how do we know that? And how do we ensure that it does? And maybe we're going to be building in learning and non-learning interventions. Right. Um, it makes sense. In fact, I'm going to say a little bit later that uh, evaluation goes right back to front-end analysis, or front-end analysis goes to evaluation. Uh, this, this water container has been opened. Is there a fresh water around anywhere? There will be. Thank you. I'll get dry. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, we can use evaluation on things other than training. The timing of what we evaluate at those levels are going to vary. Like, if I've done training, then I can compare pre-trained performance with end-of-course performance, right? But what if I put in a new reward system? It's going to take a while to take effect. I can't measure change right after I put it into place, can I? I mean, I, I won't see any change. It takes a while for it to work. In some organizations, it might take longer than in others. There's going to be some judgment involved. Similarly, uh, if I put a new feedback system in, hopefully feedback so that employees more naturally get feedback from their customers, from the work they do. Oh, thank you so much, sir. A water and a backup water. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hey, this is pure vodka. <laughs> but good. Thanks, Dick. You're welcome. So you have to consider uh, where you, what kind of intervention you have as to where you measurement, where you do your measurement, and you also have to consider both the initial intervention and the follow-up intervention. So primary, down this side, you can see that participants have been training. But as we talked about a minute ago, uh, is it maintained? Do the supervisors encourage the new performance? I, I remember uh, early on, I used to go to management training, and they would teach you about uh, theory X and theory Y. Do you have encounter that anymore? Is, it's a mystery. <laughs> okay, theory X is that people is uh, people are no damn good. 
and you have to monitor them closely and tell them what to do and follow on. Theory-wise, that people want to do well. And uh, if you give them the opportunity to do well and encourage them and give them good feedback, they'll do well. So managers were taught that. And then they come back to the organization and they practice some of their new uh, skills, like maybe active listening, sending eye messages. And their boss would say, what are you, some kind of wuss? You got that person back to work. So uh, the, the follow-up's very important. You can have job aids develop, very good ones, that can be sent around and you can stick them on your shelf without even looking at it. Unless someone encourages you to use it. Or they send you reminders or they reward you when you do use it. These are just examples. I've mentioned the new reward system. Is management using it fairly? If it doesn't, if people see examples of favoritism, for example, um, the new reward system will die. Yes, sir, I saw a hand. Uh, just noting that the primary acquisition that focuses on the participant or learner uh, and in the maintenance, it's all on supervisor. Uh, and I don't know if you have more comments on that or it just happened to be that way or just in general, that's the themes and, and the way you see it working. Well, I could do more examples. I wish I could get these little things off the screen, but I don't know how. Uh, Karen Brethauer wrote this article on the, uh, the hidden side. What's it called? Uh, you can see it in the uh, reference list. Sir. Uh, it occurs to me, Dana, that, that uh, maintenance is all about the environment. So the biggest factor in most people's environment is, is the supervisor or the manager. But it is the environmental factors that sustain or or kill any intervention. So, um, so I, I you know I I just take management and loosely think of all of the environmental factors. That's good, but I I would specifically look at supervisors and higher level managers and what they're doing to support things. Karen Bruthauer's point in the original article was that acquiring a skill or a particular set of behaviors is only part of the battle. The remaining part is making sure they stay in place. So uh, environmental factors will be a big part of that. I have a question. So if you're looking at level three, I mean the maintenance part of it, uh -huh. with the, who would be the, who would the evaluation be done on if you're looking at it from the standpoint that supervisors or management has to encourage this transfer of learning, are, are you saying that I have determined that they haven't encouraged? Or if they, if the supervisors play a primary role in making sure that this behavior continues outside of the training environment and on the job, I mean, I think you're asking a, a good question here. What I'm saying is I wouldn't immediately include, uh, conclude that it's the supervisor's lack of reinforcement. Or even if I did find that, it might not be what we call the root cause. Maybe the supervisor doesn't even know about the intervention. Maybe nobody told them. Maybe the supervisor thinks the intervention is the devil's work. He doesn't really like it. I mean, I, there's lots of analysis you would have to do to, to find it. I'm just, this is a generality. And the interesting part is finding out what's happening in your real organization. Real life. Remember, my point of view of that evaluation is it's a form of organizational research. So these all are guidelines, but they don't necessarily tell you what's happening in your specific case. The supervisor could, could encourage something, but there could be other pressures in the environment that make it impossible. For example, if I'm in a call center and I know that I'm supposed to uh, be kind to the customers who are inquiring about service, uh, and I know my supervisor wants me to do that, but um, paid in part based on 
how many calls I handle a day. There's a reward factor built into the environment that's working against me. I might have to change that. Okay? <coughs> about the, uh, how you set it up in the first place and making sure you know what questions you want answered yeah. on the front end. The, the thing that I see happening so much and it always drives me crazy is there's one or two questions that they want answered that you don't find out about until it's too late. Uh -huh. It's like if you had told me on the front end, I could have captured that data. But now that you want the answer, we've gone too far down the, down the tracks. And I yep. can't answer that question for you. That's a good point, and that does happen. That, that's a nice segue into the topic of challenges, because it, it happens to relate to uh, one of the uh, obstacles or challenges I'm going to talk about. Other questions or comments about uh, what we've talked about so far? You know the old trick. I know a lot of you have learned it in training more than one. Um, if you ask a question and nobody uh, responds, you just count to yourself to 10, 1,001, 1,002, 1, you just quiet to yourself. And there will always be somebody that's more extroverted than you in the crowd and can't stand the silence. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that to you getting toward the end of the week. <laughs> so you can see that's me, right? <laughs> you uh, I, I break every bone in my body if I'm trying to. So I won't. Here's the first obstacle. <coughs> management doesn't really want, and, and you might think I'm picking on management here, uh, but the reason for that is that I am. <laughs> Management wants endorsement. Managers have a hard time of it uh, in their work. This guy Minsberg, he's in the references, wrote back in 1973 a book called The Nature of Managerial Work. And he pointed out how disjointed it is. He interviewed a whole lot of managers. They have to move from task to task. They have millions of interruptions. There are fires going on all the time. They have many kinds of stakeholders, some of which don't show up until you least expect it. And so they want manipulable data. They want data that will work for this group of stakeholders and that they can maybe twist a little bit and have them serve this group. And, and that's what Mintzberg wrote about. The problem with evaluation data, if you're really collecting research data, they're not easily manipulated. So that's the first obstacle. Here's uh, some of the ways uh, I think you can address it. One way is to contract with management in advance. You can do this whether you're an internal consultant or an external consultant. We're going to do this evaluation. And you want to be able to answer what questions? And they list uh, questions. And you say, okay, well, can we think about it for a week? Get back to me if there's some more answers you need before we get going on this. Boy. Of course, if they're an 800 pound gorilla, they can bring up questions long after you've lost the ability to actually collect the data. But I do believe in contracting in advance. Another thing is that people often don't think about the real use of evaluation. They, they see it as threatening. We, we experienced a teeny taste of that. Um, it does two basic things. It helps you find out what works and what could use improvement. So those are both worthy goals. And this third one, if they want endorsement, not evaluation, is to decline to participate. 
Now, if you're an external consultant, this means firing your customer or your potential customer. That's hard to do, especially if you're struggling to make a living. But sometimes it's really going to work better if you know they want an endorsement. You're going to have to, if you're going to be an evaluator, or if that's going to be one of your functions, trying to find the truth is one of the things you'll be known for. Maybe you'll get more business if you're uh, willing to bend and spin, but you, you'll have trouble living with yourself probably. I know what I would. If you're an internal consultant, it can be uh, harder to decline to participate. But what I found over the uh, years is that bosses and managers have often surprised me. That uh, I remember the first time it happened when uh, it wasn't really a valuation so much, I could construe it as such, but the boss wanted me to respond to a proposal. This was back in the um, early 70s on something called PSYOPs. I didn't know what PSYOPs is. P-S-Y-O-P-S. -S. You all know what PSYOPs is? <coughs> yep, psychological operations. Psych warfare, we used to call it. I, I didn't know it, but I researched it back then. I went and I told the boss, to, to the extent I'd be any good at doing this, but the proposal wanted, I don't want to do it. And what he told me was, if you don't want to do it, we don't want to do it. And so he, just with that simple statement, made me think, you know, three times better about his company than, than I had thought before. So declining to participate uh, is a genuine option, and sometimes it can, it, it can really surprise you and help you and help others. So what ideas do you have about it when management wants endorsement, not evaluation. Yes? I think one of the things is recognizing, in the previous slide, talk about why do they do that, is to, we all have a cognitive bias to look for things which confirm our world perspective, you know, and we don't like the cognitive dissonance of finding out we are wrong. Uh, and so to humanize the management as we all do it. And then, so to, to look at that, that framework, and then I, I'm in that internal consultant world, and so how do you delicately address that? Uh, one of the things is most of them are, are, are about results and outcomes, and if you can point out to them you're too invested in the process or the intervention, and you're not focused on the outcome, and if we can shift and, and get you to pull back and, and worry less about what your baby is now and what it's going to look like when it grows up, uh, then you make some progress. That's an excellent point. I wish I'd said it. Can I copy it? Yeah, I have no, uh, I have no copyright on any of it. <laughs> Speaking of copyright, I, I think I've plastered copyright uh, probably um, uh, about uh, 28 places. Uh, in the document that I've given you or that you took off the web. You actually have my permission as ISPI members to uh, use these materials for non-commercial purposes without asking my permission. I'm granting you permission to do that. If you want to use them for commercial purposes, uh, I would prefer to hear from you first. But no, that was, uh, uh, I think, a, uh, an excellent point getting them to, telling, telling them gently that they're too involved in the uh, process rather than the outcome. Have you ever been successful giving them both, getting the data that helps them with their endorsement needs and also getting evaluation data, or is it too difficult to mix? No, it, it can be mixed, and, and I do it, but, you know, sometimes, you know, what, I've had some difficult clients, I think maybe we all have. Uh, it's their data if they're paying you for it. So you give them as complete a picture as possible, but it doesn't mean they'll use all of it. They might obscure it, and your job isn't Inspector General. 
uh, I mean personally because I think that most of our stakeholders value our honesty. I, I'd go back and I have gone back and said, well, geez, he forgot to point this out. And I, you know, the last time I did it, the guy told me it wouldn't be politic for me to do that at this point. And he knows his company's politics a lot better than I do. So I can't argue with that. Yes, George? I, I found that um, if you give them data, they'll, even if you give them data that says X, Y, and Z, if they want to turn it into Y, Z, and X, they're going to transmogrify that data to serve a number of different purposes anyway. I think it's most important to be an honest broker and deliver them what you found. What they do with it after that, really, you, you can't control it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're not Inspector General. Yeah. You can't really control it. You give them the data if they want recommendations based on it or conclusions. You give them that. They don't have to agree with them. Um, the, the only time I can remember getting into real unpleasantness about it uh, was some uh, work I was doing for, I, I won't name the organization, but uh, I had been hired to do research and find out about the organization. And, uh, and my client was very pleased with it. We'd done, actually Gloria and I did it together, and we did careful research and presented the results. But then there was an uh-oh. The client came back and said, uh, her boss wanted us to change things. And what, what, uh, what he wanted us to change uh, were the data. And uh, we wouldn't do that. So we didn't get follow up on You know, we presented the data. And, I mean, it just, I didn't feel, I felt bad about their asking. That was the case about the, uh, the cockroach in the wall. I didn't know there was a hidden decision maker that would, would come along and change the nature of the contract. Okay, moving right along, or is it too late for me to say that? Management doesn't plan evaluation up front. What about this one? That kind of goes to your comment over here. You get the questions later, after the fact. Some people think, well, we're supposed to evaluate. We better evaluate that. Okay, this is not so different from the first obstacle. I'm, I'm seeing some nodding. This is something that's familiar. Yes. I mentioned this before, that uh, first uh, bullet. When you're doing your front end analysis, when you're finding out what the problem is that you're going to address and how you're going to fix it and all like that, you're also finding out what's the measurement going to be. How do we show what will management agree agree are appropriate data that shows there's uh, a, a, a improvement has happened. So you do that while you're designing the intervention. And then at the end, you use that, those same measurements that you figured to, to do the evaluation. I say at the end, you're probably collecting data throughout. Another one, make a business case for evaluation. I've already heard some uh, uh, people commenting on that. It should be a business case in many organizations, whether it's commercial or nonprofit or government, there should be a reason that you're doing the evaluation. There's something that you're getting out of it. You need to make that case. What other ideas do you have on this one? Okay, would everybody stand up for a minute? <laughs> okay, raise your hands in the air. Wave them and say, oogie, 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 oogie. <laughs> Louder, oogie, 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 oogie. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're getting some energy moving. Any ideas come from the Ubis? No. Moving on. Well, I think all you can do is you can check with them to see if they're going to want to do it, and if they say no initially and say yes later, that's all you can do. A lot of times they don't want to do it unless they, they're scrambling at the end. They think they need to prove something. They want that endorsement because maybe it's not gone as well as they had hoped. Yeah, well, I agree with that. I mean, I wouldn't try to force evaluation on anyone any more than I force any intervention on anyone. Fear and evaluation. Yes, sir. I have worked in some organizations where I think almost the opposite is true. There's no expectation of evaluation. There, because there's such, especially if you're in a training space, there's often such incredibly low expectations of training um, that, that no, <laughs> no, it doesn't occur to management to actually evaluate the effectiveness of, of what you're doing. <coughs> And so uh, I, that's not a commercial for my current uh, employer, by the way. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I have worked at other organizations where um, the opposite is true, is more often true that I have to sell evaluation um, as, as something that they really do want, um, even though there is no awareness at the beginning that, 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 uh, that, that we would even do such a thing. Yeah. I, I have experienced that, and I do, I do sell it. And uh, you know, the, in an earlier slide, I talked about pointing out that, hey, do you want to improve uh, performance? Do you want to find out what works and what doesn't work? I mean, I, I try to make the various arguments, but as Guy said, sometimes they don't want it. And I think you're right. That's uh, training. Training is often at the bottom of the food chain. Of course, I've, I've since learned, uh, since I started saying that, that a lot of functions think they're at the bottom <laughs> of the food chain in organizations. But, but uh, uh, really, there have been, uh, you ever heard the expression turkey farm? That's a lot of training units used to be called turkey farms. It's where we put the people who couldn't perform. And, <laughs> The old saying, them is that do, do, them is that, that can't do, teach. There, there are a lot of prejudices that you have to overcome, and evaluation can help overcome it. You can find the data. So I saw a hand here, around here first, and then some back. Yep. Just uh, kind of along this part of combining with front end analysis is the idea that you can probably pitch that evaluation is part of the intervention. You know, kind of Hawthorne, just the fact that they're being washed, you're, you're doing the evaluation and that in itself is a treatment or an intervention and that you design it as part of the intervention. So it's not extra, it's part of the process. That's, that's great. I love, I'm about to hire you though, and I like that <laughs> idea a lot, but how much cheaper can you do it if you need that part of it? <laughs> I like everything you've said, and that makes sense, but we're strapped. So it, it's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. That's what and along with what you're saying about how much cheaper, um, in, in some previous uh, businesses that we've worked in, we justified evaluation as a money saving aspect to the business. Yep. Uh, and we did a lot of things that way because we were saving lives, as you said. Mm -hmm. But if you can justify it as, as saving money, mm -hmm. sometimes that works. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think evaluation, if you do it, we'll save. We'll oh, save yeah. you money. Yeah, we you might be doing a lot of things unnecessarily that uh, are costing. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, my impression of Tiagi is that he himself can do no wrong. <laughs> but people who try to do what he says can do wrong. He also says those who can't do instructional design manage. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that, Emily. I was just going to say, um, you know, sometimes we're the stakeholders who fear the evaluation too. You know, if you're, if you're in a, a learning department and you're rolling out courses and you're evaluating them and they say, nope, nothing got better, then it's your head on the chopping block. 
do. So, you know, I know that I've, I've had discussions with people where they've said, oh, you have to evaluate. And when we sit down and talk about it, and I ask them point blank, do you think if we run this course, it's going to make a difference? No. And then, you know, it, 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 well, seriously, they know their audience. They know that they are preaching a message no one wants to hear. So and they do it anyway. If they're mandated to. But it might be a good way to intervene and say, well, what would make the change? What is going to make the change? And then you build those non-training interventions. Um, you know, because we always say training leads the horse to water, but management makes it drink. Because, you know, like, <laughs> we can show them the right way, but we can't make them do it. But their right. managers can highly encourage them to, to apply those skills. Good. Right. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> So, these are some things that people can fear. They're all true. I've seen evaluation results used this way. In fact, that second one, one of the first big evaluation projects uh, I was on, which I presented on to a, ISPI used to be called NSPI. Do people know that? I know you know it, George. Uh, uh, it, uh, back in uh, 84, uh, Kathleen Keeler from uh, Bell of Pennsylvania and I presented research uh, at, an I at an NSPI conference then, uh, on a big evaluation I did for Bell of Pennsylvania's management communications program. It was a one week program, the managers got the the trainers got to go to remote sites and they had uh, mostly first level managers and it was great fun for them. And I want to cut the story a little bit short uh, on account of the uh, time, but uh, what we found out was that uh, nothing changed. And the reason it didn't change is that the skills they were being taught at the first level weren't actually used until the second level, which in many of their cases were was three to five years off. So they uh, killed the program, which saved them millions uh, a year. And that was very hard for the trainers because they loved doing it. It was fun to do. And I kind of sided with the trainers. The trainers kept saying, well, there are intangibles that people get. And I said, well, OK, help me make them tangible. Help me know what to look at to see the intangibles so we can measure whether they happened or not. Trying to be uh, an advocate, but we couldn't come up with anything. Which is interesting because I just saw that reflected in the last couple of years by the uh, Project Management Institute. Anybody in here a project management professional? Thank you. Is that pronounced pump? Or how do you pronounce that? PMP. 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 Okay. No, I know that. I just have fun with it. Yes, I thought you were going to say PMP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, they did a big study. You might be aware of it. They just published about a year ago. They've got a book out. They spent a couple of million dollars on finding out the value of project management for organizations. And they ended up basically not finding things and saying that it's mostly intangibles. And they may be right, but to me, intangibles sound like soft skills. They're not only soft until you define what you really mean. If, if you really mean something, you ought to be able to find some way to point that. A little logical positivism and action, I know, but we want to be able to measure, so we need to know at least a little bit about what we're talking about. Can you give an example of that third point, modifying an unwanted yeah. Um, <clears throat> a manager looks at the results on picking on managers. A committee looks at results and says, well, it hasn't done much in these areas, so let's add some more areas. We're going to, you know, we, we, can, we can do that. And then they, the designers already know that it's kind of weak because people aren't really practicing the skills, but getting yeah, content. But a committee comes along, looks at the results, and say, we better add more content in more areas. So that, that's an example I've seen happen. 
Okay, so what to do about it? Again, it's another one of getting, uh, starting at the beginning. And this is where I wish I had an answer for George. How do you find all the primary stakeholders? But tell the people what you're going to do at the beginning and the positive goals, how you're hoping to improve things, how you want to find, uh, you know, you're, you're not the inspector general, you're not trying to punish or close things, you want positive goals, do all that, and then say, set if-then contingencies. And the example I just talked about is, if we can't find any evidence that this training, which costs millions of years, makes any difference to anyone, what are you going to do? Well, we'd, we'd shut the program down. And Catherine Keeler's part of the presentation to NSPI back in the day was to point out that she never could have done it without the data. But she had it thoroughly documented, and she was able to go up the management chain, although there were many stakeholders, basically trainers and their bosses and people who loved the class and had been in it, who just thought it was great fun, and it was. I went to it. Wonderful class for entertainment. It just wasn't equipping people to do anything that they actually had to do anytime soon, or they'd be likely to remember. If you've got an agreement, make sure it's honored. Now, those are bold words. You may not be able to do that, but you can at least try. Hey, remember we, when we contracted up front and we agreed that if such and such and such and such were the case, you'd do so and so. You're not doing so and so. What I found is that most people that you're working with uh, want to be honorable. And if you've had a deal, even if it's just verbal and you remind them of it, they'll feel some pressure to want to honor it. If they can't, if something's changed, they'll often tell you about that. At least you've learned something. Yes? situation where agreements haven't been honored in the past. And you're saying great things about how well you're going to honor it, but people know from experience in the organization that you may not be able to do it. It hasn't happened in the past. I, earlier in my career, I'd always go in full of enthusiasm, really we're changing things with this intervention. And what I learned is that, you know, in many organizations, people for, you know, they get the flavor of the year. Some new intervention is going to make things wonderful for them, and then management changes, and that doesn't happen anymore. And so when you come bouncing in with what you're going to do or how agreements will be honored, they know from their own organizational experience that it can't necessarily so. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes. I, just, I just think, you know, you want to make the point, you're not evaluating the stakeholders, you're evaluating the training program. I know we did some evaluation of uh, the leadership program, and, and we were looking at uh, leadership behaviors that were displayed, and there was some fear, you know, that uh, the data that we collected on our certain leaders, you know, how that would be used and how it would be shared, and there was some fear of a negative message, but we were really, you know, evaluating how effective the programs were and what we needed to do, you know, in the following year to address being seen, you know, from the evaluation. Yeah, good. We're trying to help you succeed with our evaluation. That's what the data are for. Yes? Yeah, I, I was thinking you you have a ability to emphasize positive goals, but 
sometimes the opposite in this condition is, is where you, it's, it's useful to go in saying, sort of redefining what failure is. And the fear here is that it's my program, it's my baby. Somebody talks about, that's how people talk about inventions, it's their baby. Nobody wants to tell them, people that their baby's ugly, <laughs> right? So it's a matter of redefining what failure is. Part of the agreement up front should be if we evaluate the program at our specified time period and we find that it's not achieving the goals, that's not a failure, that's data. And because we've generated new data, we'll adjust and we'll move forward from that only if we have, if we let it linger <laughs> for years and years and throw money into it without evaluating it, that's failure. And so if you define it in those terms, it, it, it shifts the fear a little bit. Right. Thank you. I'm impressed by how many people uh, have not only the experiences, but good words for relating them. And this is another example. Ma'am? I think that's really helpful to look at. And back to your example with the management training, it also, when evaluating something, we can also look at, is this the appropriate audience that the product or service is being delivered to? My question about that particular example would have been, if this is a fantastic program and there are intangibles that aren't being received by these frontline managers, what would happen if this same product were delivered to mid-level managers that have been on the job five years? Mm -hmm. So there are always proposals to the client that can give them different options to, and ways to use that data. And it would have possibly worked in the Bell of Pennsylvania case that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what happened there, though, is unfortunately the people who were now in those positions had all gone through the training years ago, and there was no way you were going to make them go through it anyway. Right. <laughs> and they'd never been reinforced for doing those things because they hadn't had a chance to anyway, and they'd forgotten. Kirkpatrick level one and, and some of the useful things you can get from it, but some of the not so useful things about Kirkpatrick level one is that uh, there's a fair amount of data reported by uh, Richard Clark, Dick Clark at the uh, University of Southern California about uh, people's, uh, how much they like training actually having a negative correlation with how much they learn. I've done some of my own studies that way. So if you're doing level one as a smile sheet and you get real high smiles, it ain't necessarily a good thing. People can enjoy it and say good things about it, and it doesn't mean that they've learned. Now, I put up Perlstein level zero, and I'm allowed to do that because I actually introduced it in that chapter in the handbook I plugged a couple of times here. Uh, Perlstein level zero is hallway evaluation. Hey, George, did you go to that training we were doing last week? I was in the men's room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you say it wasn't so good, huh? <clears throat> All right. And that's it, hallway out evaluation. The boss will ask somebody that he trusts, or she'll ask somebody that, he's tr that she trusts, and then that's the end of it. So, uh, the other thing is even misusing level two. Much of the measures at the, uh, I'm using training again as an example, but uh, many of the measures are testing knowledge. And then it doesn't, they're not necessarily testing what the people will really do on the job. It's more knowing about than it actually being able to do. So that's a, that, that's a misuse of level two when you're doing it that way. By the way, how many people, if you're doing level two testing, get to do a pre-test? One. One. Some, some people, some of the time. But lots of the time, they just want a post-test. And uh, I say they. 
the organization will only tolerate a post test. There isn't enough time for the pretest, or they have various reasons you can't you can't do a pretest. Various other reasons. The difficulty uh, there is, of course, you can't look at the delta to change from before performance to after performance. All you can do is to say, if I've tested at the end and most people uh, can now do it, supposing I have a performance test, I can say, well, okay, at the end of training, most people can do it. If you press me and say, well, could they do it at the beginning of the training, <laughs> I'd have to say, I don't know, so maybe some of them could. And I just can't tell you. So how do I approach those obstacles? And we'll talk about how do you approach it. You may notice that I'm slyly uh, building in our uh, discussion groups uh, because you know we don't have individual tables and uh, easel pads to do the uh, group work on. This is not any kind of rocket science here either. It may surprise people, uh, pointing out the level zero data is not reliable. Uh, usually they, managers won't even admit to some of the ways they've made decisions. That, you know, Harry took the training and said it sucked. <laughs> and the but with level one, you really should be able to point out that the data uh, high marks on reaction sheets don't necessarily mean that the course has achieved anything. So then, if they will buy into that, then you push them to get some level two data, and there are useful ways to collect useful, I um, mean, to collect effective level two data, and you coach them on that. And then my next points are just continue to push your luck, try to get it up to level four. So what are your ideas? I mean, that's what I do, and sometimes it works, but I can't, I can also tell you sometimes it doesn't. A comment I'd like to make about the level one is that uh, Roger Chevalier, former ISPI staff member, has written an article, and I can't remember exactly when it was published, but he was at Century 21, and he looked at 100 different trainers, and the trainers with the worst scores in level one evaluations had the best students out there making all their numbers as real estate agents. And the, and the teachers, the instructors that scored the highest had the worst performers out in the field. And so that just is an example here of where you really can't trust level one data because it's whether they liked it or not. Now I can tell you whether the room is too hot or the materials aren't adequate or whatever, but it can be very misleading in terms of what's the end result if you don't do the rest of the evaluation. That's right. And it has bad effects on trainers too. I mean, I've seen trainers kind of uh, whining for good grades at the end of training. You know, if you like me, be sure. And if you like the training, be sure to comment. You know, they, they grade me. Oh well. Yes, sir. Um, if you're uh, if you're if you're talking about training intervention that's focused on skills, um, I've often incorporated level two into the course itself in the form of a capstone project of some kind. So teaching engineering, the last thing they do on the last day is engineer something. Right. Uh, teaching sales, the last thing they do on the last day is sell something. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing in effect is, is, uh, is performing a level two evaluation um, and it's transparent to the participants because it's incorporated into the activities. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've used that approach, and uh, especially at the uh, Department of Labor, uh, where I was first taught how to do that. What you're doing is equipping people to do their job, but I mean, if the job is pretty complex, like a medical claims examiner, uh, occupational safety and health, you have to do it in little bits uh, all along, and you are collecting the data too, but the end part, as you say, is putting the whole piece together. You'd be processing so several kinds of claims representative of those that come in. And uh, that's also your final test. But it's a learning experience too. Mm -hmm. That dovetails into one of the other purposes of an evaluation, which is to provide uh, constructive feedback. And if you're going to provide a capstone, you still have to make sure that it's criteria back and say, you did great, except for step B3 where you're supposed to fold your hand on the patient's artery so he didn't bleed to death. Other than that, everything <laughs> was great. So, you know, we've got to make
make sure that we're referencing things back to you know, what the performance criteria are. That's right. And that's the way at, at labor that we would we would build it. We would determine, work with exemplary performers and find out what they did different from ordinary performers and then teach the ordinary performers how to do those things. And that means meeting the criteria. And we have to measure it. They wouldn't actually get out of the course if they were leaving the meeting. Okay. We've talked a little bit. Uh, well, no, we haven't talked about this one so much. But I, somebody asked about level three uh, at the beginning when we were talking about objectives for this. So one thing is that uh, you can't, collecting data would be a good idea, but you can't really do it. We can't really test hypotheses in this business. Or here's another one that, you know, we surveyed the hell out of our people. We can't have another survey coming in. I see grins. You've heard that one, right? Okay. Or it's too expensive or it invades privacy or whatever. Okay, so what do you do? This first one, using existing measures of job performance is very, very important. And I think you all know that. You get, get exposed to that a lot. If you put in new measures and people have to do something different to collect things, they'll resist it and they likely won't do it. They're used to their work lives. They're busy already. They don't want to take on new tasks or resist it. So, uh, I've been kind of bad-mouthing management in places, but generally they know what their managers want. They know what outcomes are important. They have measures for it. Use the existing measures. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you, you might have to create another measure or show them what they could be measuring. And that's a different topic, but whenever possible, use the existing measures. <laughs> now this next dark bullet that I have up there even the very word scares people sometimes. Quasi-experimental design. Oh. Sounds like Frankenstein. Or is that Frankenstein? <laughs> Pearl Stein. Now you never will remember. Okay. So uh, that was uh, Campbell and Stanley introduced that back in the 50s, and it's been revised. But quasi-experimental design is basically uh, okay, you don't have a lab situation, but you can still set up uh, some kind of design. So you can do pre and post measures on interventions, and you can compare it with a similar series. So for example, suppose you have five divisions in your company. You can roll out the intervention in this division that's fairly isolated from the others first and test it out and test performance there on something that they're doing against what's happening in other divisions. Stagger the time so you have equivalent uh, periods between when you start the intervention and when you start it in the other place. And then simple statistical measures can show you whether there's a difference. And when I say simple statistical measures, I mean really simple stuff like comes with Excel. Most of you already have Excel. So there's a data pack that comes with it. You have to download it. But it allows you to do things like simple analyses of variance. You don't have to do SPSS. I mean, it's good if you can do big experiments. That's fine. But even with the common tools that are around many offices, you can compare groups and see if they actually differ um, statistically. And if they do, then you can say, well, geez, these, this group got the intervention here. This group got the intervention here. It improved here with the first group. It improved here with the second group. You've got your data. Emily, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think one of the big obstacles around 3 and 4 is it's not our data, so to speak. In other words, the level 1 comes from my LMS. The level 2 comes from my team. But the level three and four, you're more likely to be going out and collecting data about what's actually happening in the business. 
um, or you might be getting something from an HR system. And just to be honest, there are times that the data gets past our own skills. Um, you know, I'm lucky that I have a guy that I can say, can you take this from the HR system about, you know, how many months they've been managers and then match it up to this that we did, you know, in the, the LMS about what we trained them on and then this about how their employees are, are you know, rating them and put it all together and he can do the e lookups and all that sort of stuff that I don't actually know how to do. So, you know, I, I think there are, there are times you get beyond what you can do with the tools and the knowledge you have within a running organization. Yeah, so we don't I'm sure that's so. We don't have the luxury of having, you know, a dedicated evaluation person. With those that's tools. why you call Dr. Perlstein. Right. Thank you, George. <laughs> if I were Tiagi, I'd want him back with a dollar for you, or maybe it's a five then. Yes. Uh, the other thing, that I, I, I've used your quasi-experimental design before. The, uh, one of the simple ways is to, um, is to wrap your measures around early adopters within an organization. Um, and that has the added advantage of I can then advertise the intervention to the rest of the organization. So those people who implemented this program saw a 12% increase in sales. So that, that helps me both evaluate the program and market it to the, uh, to the rest of the organization. Yep. And another thing I do and, and, uh, is to say, well, we can't roll out everything at once. You've got these different regions. Can we can we start with this region? And I get pushed back. No, if it's important enough to do, they all deserve it now. Well, where are you going to get the money for all those, you know, people? To so you you try to get it where you can do it at different times. But uh, uh, I agree with an, another part of what Emily was saying is uh, that it, it's not just outside your skill comfort, because you could call me in or others in, uh, as part of ISPI net, network, uh, you, can, you can talk with different people and get ideas. But organizations don't necessarily want to share the data. So that's a big problem. Even if you could get it, and what I try to do in those cases is to say, look, I don't, I, I can show you how to collect them, I can show you how to analyze them, could you do that for me? <laughs> that kind of thing. I don't have to see the data. And it gets a little iffy. I've tried that. But I mean, one of my clients uh, where I did a big evaluation project with was a, one of those three-letter government uh, members of what we call the uh, intelligence community. And uh, so they had feelings about level three data, what things were actually being done. Level four. Hey, did I miss somebody? Yes, sir. Computer guy. I forget your name. That's Chris. <laughs> computer. I'll answer computer guy, actually. So, okay. No, I was just going to say, uh, to, to uh, uh, Illy's comment, in some ways, can't you humanize this? In other words, if, I'm, if I have a stakeholder who um, manages salespeople, well, there are numbers being tracked for salespeople. I mean, there, there, there are numbers all over the place. If I can go to that stakeholder and say, this is the intervention that we're looking at. Here's what I know about the intervention. Now you tell me, what do you know about sales numbers in this time period? And without, it's almost, I can't, maybe quasi, quasi experimental would be the thing. But if you're looking for general trends, we placed an intervention here. Do you see any impact? Have you seen it in the numbers that you look at every month anyway? And that's the way you start the conversation. Not start it not with the numbers, but with the, the people that care about you know the ups and the downs. I, I like the concept of humanizing things, uh, and I'm for it, and I think that's a, a good thing. What quasi-experimental design is about is finding some kind of natural control group, because it's a multi-factor world. All kinds of things are going on. You may have done the intervention, but that you may have been able to do it because management is on such and such kind of kick and spreading their expectations that these things are going to change, and that may have had a great deal of influence. So you need to be able to tease out the different factors as best you can. And if you can do that in a human way, it will work better. I agree with that.
but I'd still look for some kind of control just so I can see, uh, I can compare a place with the intervention to a place that maybe is at the other factors but not the intervention. Dick? You know, Rich, I think one of the things that really puts people off about levels three and four is trying to identify the causal link. There's so many other factors, external factors, and it's particularly if you've done a learning intervention, how do you know your learning intervention caused the change, good or bad? What can you tell people? What advice can you give people about that? Um, well, the, the uh, you know, part of my background is I started out in experimental psychology. And so what you learn is that there's many, many variables all happening at once. You can't possibly control them. Right. But if you randomly assign, uh, the extraneous variables will balance each other out. And the one that you've manipulated, the independent variable, is the one constant that you know has changed. This group got it, this group didn't. Well, but there were 2,000 other factors you identified. Yes, but I assigned them randomly to these groups. So they should have each had pretty much those same factors impact on them. And in quasi-experimental design, it's not always easy to do that. If you take, for example, the early adapters, as one, one suggested, you may have some of the smarter people, some of the more eager people, some of the people who care more. If you do it by geographical region, uh, you, you may have uh, some big differences in variables between uh, people in the Rust Belt and uh, people in the uh, Sun Belt. I don't know. So you, you have to look and see the extent to which you can hope the variables balance out. Thank you. The last obstacle that I have to address talked about the intangible. The other part is the benefits may be far transfer. Beyond, beyond any time frame I can talk about. Somebody mentioned leadership development. Okay, well, that's a long process. And our leaders may not be, we may not see them in the leadership position until 10 years from now. But we know the processes we put them through are helping. We can't look at the far transfer. You hear things like these? Or is this just one that I've kind of bumped into? I'm sitting with head shaking. Right? Some up and down, some sideways. Okay, here's what I mean. If it's an intangible, try to get them to at least list examples of the intangible. It makes employees happier. How do you know that? One test we generally use is, uh, can we see four teeth, or eight teeth, or 16 teeth? You know, the tooth test. How happy are they? Of course, I'm joking about that. But the, uh, you, you try to find some ways where they can actually point to, to benefits whatever their indicators are. And then you show them the way to measure it. Another one, another one is that uh, show them the actual eye in ROI. What's it costing? It's far transferred. We won't be able to know for years whether this really paid off. <laughs> you know, training is for dogs. So we educate, that's for for humans, and you never know when they might use that It'd be a long time from now. Okay, well, what's your education costing? It's costing your organization uh, $2.5 million a year. What are you getting from that? So those are uh, some of the ways I do that. Uh, fortunately, we've come to the time where you get to talk about other obstacles. What ones haven't we talked about that you want to address? Yes. Uh, stakeholders might have had some bad 
nightmare past experiences with the evaluation, and they would consider it unwise to go down that path again. Okay. So similar to uh, what you had said earlier about not being able to trust, who has ideas about what you would do with that? People have nightmare experiences with uh, evaluation. Well, first I tried to understand exactly what was the essence of that nightmare and what about it was nightmarish and see if there's some way to navigate and avoid some of those pitfalls that they experienced before to ease their apprehension about that. Do performance analysis. I don't have a lot to add there. Mm -hmm. Nightmares are things that have, uh, have effective, big effective impact, hang with people and really can change people. I mean, you've probably heard about recent studies that uh, <clears throat> kids who were forced to eat certain things at, you know, in their early years avoid them for the rest of their life. Well, you know, I mean, they can live, live almost as long as me. sponsor careful evaluation, spent quite a bit of money at it, learned a lot, improved the program, which included, uh, I think, 21 different courses, some that lasted as long as a week. And uh, when he retired, the person that came in uh, cut the program almost immediately. First, she cut the evaluation. Then she cut the program. Now it's a couple of years later, and they're trying to revive the program, but it's going to be, for some people, kind of a nightmare to get that program going again. It was in the area of uh, project management, by the way, also systems engineering. OK, well, it looks to me like we're out of time. Any urgent last minute questions or comments? One more obstacle. You have plenty of time to story. The one I see most often is that people are so interested in getting on to the next intervention that even though they spent money on this one, by the time it's done, all they want to do is get on to the next one. I, I, I've even offered clients that will do level three evaluations for free. And like in your obstacle, they don't want to spend the time in the workplace or seems to be the one that I see. It's just, you know, on to the next thing, counts the butts and seats. Who cares about evaluation? Yeah. It amazes me that they'll spend money to do it, but they won't spend a dime to see if they're working on it. I, I not only know the feeling, but I, I, I adapted this from somebody else back in the 80s. I had a small corporation called the Dyad Corporation. We were initially incorporated in Delaware, and I had in our brochure a guarantee if you will let us measure, if you specify results and let us measure it, but we don't achieve it, we'll either continue until we achieve the results you want or you put your money back. This no papers, not a single paper. I mean, we, we had business, people took us up, but they wouldn't take us, they wouldn't honor that, that part. Yeah, so. that's so different in my experience. I'm, a lot of the stuff that I've, I've dealt with has been like, really large system of process changes. And, and they definitely want level three results. They want to know, and 
the reason that they want to know and they want you to do it is because they want to blame you if you don't get them. <laughs> and that's Henry. Makes sense to me. I wish that that was more of a common experience. Because it's not. You know, what is common, uh, and uh, gee, I can't remember the study, another graduate student pointed it out to me recently, that um, if you survey managers, they'll tell you they want level three and four. They just won't do it. You know, most of the surveys about what level measurement goes on is level one, and then it drops to level two, and then it plummets to level three and level four. But if you ask the managers what they want, do they want level one or level two, they go, no, not so much. We want three and four. So I don't know. But I do want to thank you all for coming. I was told we were like uh, 6.30 to 8. If people want to hang out and talk a little bit, I'm up for that. But I know it's the middle, well, not the middle of the week, and toward the end of the week. A lot of you have to get ready for the, uh, isn't there a big event at the Speedway this week? <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so thanks very much for coming. I really appreciate it.